Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Yakel, Interim Dean of the University of Michigan School of Information. Theme years create a community experience around a thought-provoking concept through coursework, performances, workshops, speakers, and the opportunity to create tangible artifacts that can be used by the community and for societal good. The University of Michigan School of Information determined that an ideal topic for academic year 2023-24, our first theme year, would be water conservation and access. We sought a theme that is relatable to everyone in our community, no matter their home state or country, no matter what their career path. We also wanted to bring attention to the magic of the Great Lakes the defining attribute and literal border of the state of Michigan, the Third Coast. For example, we face a variety of issues and challenges associated with water in Michigan. In 2014, the Detroit Water and Sewage Department began shutting off water service to tens of thousands of Detroit residents who stopped paying their water bills. In 2015, residents of Flint learned they were drinking water contaminated with lead, putting themselves, especially their children, at significant risk. As of 2020, Nestle was pumping more than 1 million gallons of water per day from northern Michigan wells to be bottled and sold elsewhere, but paid only $200 a year for the permit to access the water. And today, the Great Lakes are plagued by the invasion of 220 non-native species, over 30 of which are known to threaten our ecological systems. While these examples are local, the challenges involving water access and conservation continue to create health issues and economic stress, disrupting the lives and livelihood of individuals worldwide. This is why we have invited the Michigan Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist to join us today for our 2023-24 um, theme year keynote speaker. He is here to provide us with an in-depth understanding of how these issues affect Michigan and the world, as the Great Lakes encompass 21% of the Earth's fresh water. Shedding light on these issues will help our students throughout the year as you connect to our local community and beyond in pursuing projects and serve as an impactful example of the important ways in which information professionals enhance social justice issues. Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist has dedicated his career to solving problems. A computer scientist and computer engineer by training he uses thoughtful and fact-based practices to solve real problems and make government work better for Michigan citizens and families. As part of Governor Gretchen Whitmer's administration, he has focused on helping Michiganders in communities across our state realize their full economic and political potential. Since taking office in 2019, the administration has made transformational investments in Michigan's water infrastructure. Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist believes investment in water infrastructure is a priority. These investments support good paying jobs, ensure every parent can give their child a glass of drinking water with the knowledge it is safe. I'm proud to say that, that the Lieutenant Governor in 2018 was the founding executive director of the Center for Social Media Responsibility at UMSI. He is also an alumnus of the University of Michigan. So here to talk with us about the importance of water conservation and access, please welcome Michigan Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. All right, good evening, everyone. This is a good evening, everyone, is it not? Yes, I think it is. I'm proud to be back on campus and proud to be back here with SI. Beth, I wanna thank you for the introduction. I wanna thank you for 
the invitation, the, the chance to be here uh, back with SI students is a bit of a home game for me. Um, for, she may not have mentioned, but I did spend a little bit of time here on staff at SI in 2018. In fact, I was literally sitting next to Cliff Lampy when now Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Whitmer called me and asked me to be her running mate. So I had to like take the call in another room. And I came back and I told him that I wasn't coming back. <laughs> but it's all good. Thankfully that worked out. I also want to give a, a shout out in absentia to my good friend, uh, Paul Resnick, who I credit with inviting me to have the opportunity to be the founding executive director of the Center for Social Media Responsibility uh, here at SI and thank the entire uh, team of researchers and faculty that I got to work with on that experience for, I think I was only there for like six months, but it was a good six months, like a really good six months. I also want to thank every student, every staff member, every member of the SI family for welcoming me back here today. So we can talk about this important theme. This theme week, thing, this theme thing is pretty cool. Like I don't remember actually engaging with that um, as a student or as a staff member. So it's really a great opportunity to be able to, to at least play some small role in this, this year. You know, SI is important to me. I was a double engineering major, but I did take a couple of SI classes when I was an undergraduate and even though my computer science and computer engineering training is something that I think about every day and that I'll refer to a few times here about this work, um, it was SI that taught me the lesson that really fundamentally framed how I think about the world and how I think about problem solving, how I think about inequity, and how I think about opportunity. And that was because in an information economics class, and that time it was SI 646, was when I was introduced to the concept of information asymmetry, the notion that different people, different entities have different levels, different forms, different qualities, different access to information. And that really, that inequity, you can model that on any relationship or interaction. And that kind of is like an underlying inequity that you can see everywhere. You can see in every instance and in every problem that needs to be solved. And so even when we're talking about whether it's water access, water quality, or opportunities for stronger infrastructure, this notion of information asymmetry, meaning who knows what to invest in, who knows when to do it, who knows what caused the problem, who knows what inequities underlie injustices, that is what we have an opportunity to deal with and to solve once we understand that concept and that relationship. Now, SI broadly is something that I think all of you, I hope, are proud to be associated with. I think this really does, the school has a unique and important mission when it comes to or when it's compared to alongside its sister schools within the university. This notion of preparing socially engaged information professionals to create people-centered knowledge, systems, and institutions for the information age, that's something that really is critical. And frankly, I think we need more people with this type of motivation in more places, whether that is in the public sector where I am in different parts of the private sector beyond those who merely define themselves as information professionals. Like, I think we need this sensibility to permeate more opportunities for problem solving. Because what you fundamentally understand, or at least what you're learning to understand, is that when you equip a person with information, you inspire and empower them. You help them make better decisions, you help them more reach their potential, but frankly, you also position them to create more space and opportunity for others to do the same. We create these kind of virtuous cycles that really come together like puzzle pieces. They actually can create a more complete picture and a complete understanding of what's possible in a given community or in a given situation. So the information part, that's really important. And I, I hope that all of y'all are like really good at that. But the thing that I think perhaps helps you reach the scale that I think is more important is the socially engaged and people-centered piece of that. This is about more than information. This is really about connection and community. This is about creating systems. Because I think that in order for us to change systems or to get the scale of change that we need in any system, we need systems thinkers. And by being trained information professionals, you will inherently become systems thinkers. You won't 
default to solutions that are small. You won't default to only challenging individuals to come up with micro solutions to macro problems. You'll think about how systems need to be better, they need to be more responsive in order to truly get the changes that we need. Now at heart, that's gonna be driven by information and data-based solutions. And you know, I, I've learned a bit about that in my career and in my own studies and have tried to apply that to the problems that I've been privileged to be able to solve. And for those who don't know, I am from the city of Detroit. I was born, I don't know if anybody's from Detroit, hopefully from the east side of Detroit. If you're from Detroit, it's the best side. But after coming out of University of Michigan, I, I went to Seattle to be a software engineer at Microsoft. I did that for four years. That was great. It's a great place to work. But I really didn't forget the place that I came from, even in the midst of doing that. You know, my introduction to the importance of connectivity had to do with helping people get internet access in the middle of the city of Detroit where they did not have it in the year 2001. To think about it, in one of the biggest cities in our country, you had people that literally lived in the center of a city who couldn't access the internet. Not being able to access that meant that there are many other pieces of information that they did not have access to as a result of that lack of connectivity. But working with researchers here at the University of Michigan to do a study about what people would do with the internet, how people would use it, how much would they pay for it, what would it enable to unlock for them, helped me recognize the importance of connectivity. Another instance was after graduating from Michigan, after working in Seattle and working in Washington, D.C. as a community organizer for five years and coming home to the city of Detroit, creating an application for non-emergency service requests called Improved Detroit, where it was the first time I saw water infrastructure and its challenges up close and personal. In our city, I'll talk about two of them that we had challenges with. One of them was something very mundane, the fire hydrant. Have I seen a fire hydrant? I don't know if you've seen a broken one before. But a broken fire hydrant would be the difference between life and death, the difference between saving a home that's on fire and not saving that home, the difference between a fire jumping from one structure to another structure and spreading. Well, fire hydrants are definitely critical infrastructure in the city of Detroit, which is the, has the busiest fire department in the country, but our firefighters had no way of understanding when they got to a fire incident whether or not the hydrant they were looking at was functional. And so you had situations where they would take a hose off of a truck, plug it into a fire hydrant, hit the lever, and nothing came out. And so again, that meant that more people might get hurt, more people could pass away, more buildings could get damaged. So when I came in, I was challenged to fix that, because what do you give information in a technology professional start to put a problem to solve? And so I worked with the firefighters, I worked with the Detroit Water and Sewage Department to change the way we inspected fire hydrants so that we could have a way for the firefighters that do the inspections to actually be able to pass information to the water department so they could actually know where they needed to fix hydrants and do so efficiently using a you know, GIS-based program, mobile applications, these kind of things that made sense for people. And that worked out pretty well, and now all of our fire hydrants actually work. That's great. But the moral of the story is not having information about which fire hydrants were broken was a matter of life and death. There can't be anything that was more stakes, high stakes than that. So I think about these, and I think about how they intersect with water infrastructure challenges and water access challenges, even as I come to the work as Lieutenant Governor of Michigan. Because even in this Great Lakes state, and I know that you referred to the fact that we do have 21% of the fresh water on the globe here, we still have some communities that struggle with significant challenges when it comes to water quality, water access, and water affordability. But I am proud to say that Governor Whitmer and I have made as a central piece of our work to make sure that every Michigander could have access to clean, healthy, safe, fresh water, to drink, to bathe with, to cook with, to have fun in, to survive. And so one example of this is in a city in Southwest Michigan, a city of Benton Harbor, Michigan. It's a smallish city. And after water quality tests revealed that there was elevated lead levels in Benton Harbor, we needed to replace all of the lead service lines in the city, literally all of the lead lines in a city. And so um, in 2021, in October of 2021, I went to Benton Harbor and we held an event where we announced that although it typically takes in a city of Benton Harbor size to replace every lead service line in that city, that would be a seven year project that we were gonna replace all of those lead service lines in two years because it didn't make sense for people to drink seven years of bad water. 
that we needed to have urgency, we needed to have investment, and we needed to have deployment to solve this problem. Now, that was a pretty Herculean effort and a pretty ridiculous announcement to make. We were confident that we had aligned the, the coalition, we had aligned the stakeholders, we had aligned the infrastructure providers to be able to solve this problem. Now, I made a two-year commitment, but I was a little hopeful that we could do it in faster than two years because, again, of the urgency of the problem. And thankfully, because of God's grace, good luck, great team, good technology, skilled professionals, and a committed community, we were able to actually replace 99.97% of those lines in 18 months. And now people in, from, in Benton Harbor are drinking clean water. And we did that and announced it last year. What it shows me is that when you decide to pay attention to a problem, you can solve it. When you decide to focus on an issue, you can make progress on addressing that issue. And when you do so with well-equipped team members, with people who are committed to solving the problem, have the best command of the tools at their disposal, they can actually do something about it. Now let's talk a little more about some water access challenges, specifically here in Michigan. I know that uh, students at SI heard just a few weeks ago from our state's clean water public advocate, Chris Donaldson, so this Office of Clean Water Public Advocate is something that Governor Whitmer and I invented in 2019. We organized state government to create the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. We established two new functions in that department to center the needs of the community when it came to water access. This Clean Water Public Advocate was one of those roles. And, and one of the reasons that we established this is because, frankly, we had seen too many communities that had clean water issues for far too long, whether that is Flint's, whether that is Bend Harbor, whether that's the city of Highland Park, or you pick a city, a, a smaller city in Michigan, a lot of them had issues. And some of those issues could not just be solved with infrastructure fixes. Sometimes we had to do affordability programming. And the Office of Clean Water Public Advocate during the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, was one of the leading voices to help us design a policy to make sure that not a single Michigander was to have their water shut off during the pandemic because water was connected to people actually being able to survive here in the state of Michigan. And Chris talked about some of the challenges that people have been facing when it comes to water here in the state. We have, for example, um, you know, issues of when it comes to people being able to have communal water spaces, when they may live, live, live in shared spaces, knowing that folks would have equitable access to it. But in order to actually make progress as an advocate, you must have fundamental understanding. And in order to start your journey toward understanding, you must be able to collect and analyze data and turn it into information and knowledge and then the wisdom to know what to do next. More than 1,400 communities in the state of Michigan and 9,500 non-community water supplies serve the people of Michigan. We also have, on top of that, 1.2 million private wells. Basically, our water system is quite disparate here in our state. Now, in a lot of places, these, these pieces of infrastructure have experienced like decades of disinvestment, decades of disinvestment. And there's been an annual funding gap before we took office of actually trying to make those infrastructure investments of at least $1 billion. Now, these patchworks of municipalities and their municipal water systems and things like that they're trying to do their best to provide customers and their residents with reliable update information on the water coming from their pipes, but they're not always able to meet that standard. It's not easy, even if you do have the data, to, to like synthesize it into a form that your customers can actually understand. Like who knows what this percentage of water quality versus that percentage of water quality actually means. It's all a foreign language. Data collection can differ by location in terms of how well instrumented some of these systems may be. The formats vary. All of these different municipal water systems, they literally have different systems that are not able to speak to one another. So it's difficult for us to get a comprehensive understanding of the state of water delivery here in the state of Michigan. The same is true for billing, which gets to the question of affordability, which is often in consumers' minds obviously linked to quality. This also hurts people's opportunities to participate in some of the water affordability programs that we design and seek to execute. So with all that said, it means that there is a lot of opportunity 
for information professionals to help make these systems make sense, help make these systems be more responsive, help make these systems actually deliver what they were designed to do, and that's deliver safe, accessible water at an affordable rate. So Governor Whitmer and I, we're, we're really committed to helping to make this happen. We launched something, for example, called the My Clean Water Plan, which has invested more than $2 billion to upgrade drinking water, stormwater systems, wastewater systems across the state. And this, in addition to those investments, they also have supported the creation and sustaining of about 30,000 highly skilled jobs, engineering jobs, technicians, workers, et cetera. In 2022, we created something called the Building Michigan Together Plan. And this invested additional, an additional $2 billion for lead service line replacements similar to the ones that we did in Benton Harbor. This also is working to help us, Michigan, continue to be the leader in advancing research on PFAS contamination. I've advocated personally to the federal government for there to be a federal standard for how much PFAS is safe in your water. Newsflash, the answer is zero, that none of it is safe. But the federal government doesn't actually set a standard to know what, when they need to trigger further research or further, um, for further participation in actually solving and mitigating PFAS contamination. And that patchwork is bad because we have a lot of PFAS sites, frankly, here in the state of Michigan. And there's a lot of research being done here at Michigan Medicine to understand the broader public health impacts of that level of exposure to PFAS sites. In 2023, our fiscal year budget that we signed at the end of June of this year, we invested additionally uh, millions of dollars to protect drinking water and a new package of bills to help communities access funding on a revolving basis to water infrastructure to solve their different needs. Because while some communities might need less service line replacement, some might need new wastewater or stormwater systems, some might need to improve those systems. We need to make sure there's this fund, these funding sources are flexible to meet the infrastructure challenges that will ultimately help us from the affordability standpoint. We also have significant challenges in the state and a lot of communities when it comes to flooding. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but when, where I grew up in Detroit on the, on the east side, my basin flooded every time it rained, like literally every time it rained. The smell of wet carpet is something that was very, very familiar to me as a child. I learned how to use a shop vac because every time it rained, my dad and I had to go and try to vacuum up the carpet in my basement. And there are a lot of communities that have, they're dealing with consistent flooding, whether it is Detroit, whether it is Dearborn. Um, I have seen too many times since I returned to Michigan in 20, 2014, flooded freeways. And so we've made investments to help harden that infrastructure, whether that is the utility infrastructure to make sure that the electricity flowing to water pumps for freeways doesn't fail, whether that is helping local municipalities invest in projects to be able to harden their infrastructure, to, to, whether that's rebuilding uh, seawalls and storm walls, whether that is training professionals on what to do, whether that is improving our system for, in, at the Great Lakes Water Authority to make sure that our stormwater system actually have the capacity to handle this historic only climate change induced rain where we're seeing once in 500 year storms every two years. And we should come up with a different name than once in 500 years. And we're trying to harden our infrastructure, but we also are connecting this to our work to more broadly respond to climate change or at least Michigan's, Michigan's contributions to it so that we can be carbon neutral by 2050 or sooner, so that the state government can actually be carbon neutral by the year 2030, so that we can change where we are getting our energy supplies from here in Michigan. We can build on the momentum of closing two coal-fired power plants in the last five years and the plan to close a third one in the next two, so that we can add more renewable energy to our mix, everything from nuclear in Southwest Michigan to more renewable wind and solar energy that's being debated in our state legislature today. We have a lot of opportunities to make Michigan a stronger place when it comes to not only our climate change response, but then how that impacts our water systems and people's access to it. Now, our next fiscal year budget has another $600 million to invest in water infrastructure and millions more for both quality assurance and guaranteed water affordability for more people in Michigan. It's just really sad that there were so many people who cannot afford to drink clean water in their own homes in our state, and we are seeking to end that reality. We also have made significant investments to protect our Great Lakes, and particularly from invasive species. I'll give you an example. So Asian carp is an invasive species that, is, that has been in too many of our Great Lakes, and it has frankly wreaked havoc 
on that ecosystem. One of our core asks to the federal government every year, including I was with President Biden earlier this week, and one of the things I asked him about is additional federal support for invasive species research and mitigation here in the state of Michigan. This is an asset that is uniquely Michigan's and we are uniquely responsible for. We need the federal government's help to make sure we can remain the best stewards of it. At the same time, we have made significant investments in ensuring that commerce that goes through water can do so effectively and can do so in a clean and environmentally friendly way. The, the sort of headline project for that is our Sioux Locks in, the, over in Lake Superior in the Upper Peninsula, um, where it is some of the most critical infrastructure for American manufacturing that had not been updated since the 1940s. But we finally are making updates to the Sioux Locks now this year, thanks to work that our congressional delegation has secured. So all that to say is that there's progress being made. But really what I want to leave you with is that there's a hell of a lot more that we need to do. And that will only happen at the scale that is necessary. We can only be the example for the country and the world if we have more information professionals keyed in to help solve the water challenges of our generation. Because make no mistake about it, as we read headlines from around the country where you have states that literally have had to put pausing, have, put, have had to put pauses on the construction of new homes, where we have seen that the Earth's axis has, the Earth itself has, had to, has changed its tilt because of how much groundwater has been extracted from our planet. Water management will be the chat, one of the challenges of our generation. And in order to understand how we can meet that challenge, we need smart, we need bold, we need connected information professionals to be part of the process. So what I want you to do is consider how you can take your talents and apply them to this problem. How you can do that on a full-time basis by coming and joining me in the public sector. I never considered working in the public sector when I was in college. It turns out it's amazing, and I'll tell you why. I worked in the private sector at Microsoft. It's a huge company. There's billions of customers, and that's great. I worked in the public sector. I mean, I worked as a community organizer, as an advocate for direct service organizations and political empowerment organizations. But if you truly are a problem solver, I think you want to solve the biggest problems that impact the most people. Well, there is no place, there is no sector, there's no entity or institution that was designed to serve every person except the government. Like the, when the government is doing well, it is responsive to the needs of every single constituent that it serves. That is not true for anything in the private sector. That's not true for any advocacy or direct service organization or non-government organization, but that is true in the public sector. So I know all of you are ambitious and I want you to apply that ambition in the biggest way to help the most people and to scale the solutions to the most critical challenges of our time. And I think we need you in the public sector to do that because these water problems are not gonna solve themselves. And there currently are not enough of you and enough of us in the sector to meet this problem solving need at the scale that we must. You have unique skills, you have unique backgrounds, you have unique sensibilities. We need you to step up and to step in. There is no one in the country serving an elected office that has my background, the background of an information professional who actually wrote code, who actually formed, formed businesses and sold them with code that he wrote himself. And that is sad that I am such an anomaly. But if you step up and step in, then I won't be an anomaly. It won't be interesting because you will know that you will bring something unique to the table to solve the kinds of problems in the way that only you can solve them. It'll give you confidence when a person says that a problem is intractable you won't think it's intractable because you know that problems have answers, like questions have answers. There are solutions that exist and hard things don't scare you. Hard things do not scare people who are equipped with information and the skills and the tools to make progress. So whether it is on water, like this theme, this theme time is about, I want you to think about water challenges. Whether it is in the area of criminal justice reform, if that's something you care about, we want you to apply your solutions to those areas as well. Whatever drives you, and there, is ha there has to be something, I wanna make sure that you consider, at least consider, bringing those to the realm where you can have the largest scale of impact. And if you do so, then the states, the nations, and the world's water will be better off. Then the world's people, the state's people, our nation's people will be better off, and we can do even more. And I am proud to welcome you to the opportunity to join in this fight that we all can win. And when we all have access to the water that God blessed us with, 
when we all do not have to question whether that water is safe, when we all can look with confidence at the water we give our family members. That'll be a better Michigan for years and decades to come. So thank you so much for having me here to talk about this important topic. And I really look forward to your service to your people and your communities. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? There we go. Hey, I wondered where you went. I've been in the office all these years. Yeah, and... I never came back. Yeah, you never came back. <laughs> all right, here's a few questions that came from the audience. Thanks again for your remarks. Uh, so what are the greatest challenges associated with data in government work, especially related to this water topic? So I think that, that there are several. The first one that comes to mind is so issues of like, you know, whether it's water infrastructure that needs to be updated or water affordability, these problems have the characteristic of like everyone knows there's a problem, but we don't really have a full grasp of the scale. Or we don't really have a full grasp of what it might look like in this particular community. Like there may be sort of headline versions of this that exist in certain communities, but we don't have like, uh, to use a, a metaphor, like we don't have the right glasses that when we look at this community, we see it in, the, in their way, and we look at this community, we see it in a different way. And so I think a lack of instrumentation of our systems and infrastructure is one of the challenges. Now, on like a super technical level, if, you're, if you go to anyone who manages like a stormwater or a wastewater system, those systems are instrumented. But once we're talking about the delivery mechanisms to individuals' homes, that's where it kind of falls off. And so I think we do have an opportunity to think about how we can better measure um, just like where water is going, yeah. um, and that would help us uh, understand a lot about the problems we need to solve. Well, it seems like it's also a challenge to communicate that scale to people, that that's also a place where data might help. Yeah, I think, I think certainly, well, the communication problem, I sort of alluded to this a little bit, but once we, again, once we have data and information, then like the next step is to like make that make sense to uh, either a normal person or a decision maker. It's funny how those can be different, but I think, this is again where, where the sort of training that you get in SI is important because I think that you sort of, we show people how to do that and how, how to make things make sense to people. And certainly a lot of my job as a, as a public official is to try to make complex things make sense and, and to, to, to communicate about them in a way that it not only is accessible, but that ultimately can be actionable for people. And so certainly there's a lot of help to be had there too. So the water system and infrastructure is arguably the most affected system to be affected by climate change. Uh, historical data is no longer indicative of what will happen, right? Like you said, 500 year storms are no longer 500 years. So what does this mean for data driven solutions? What does it mean for smart infrastructures? What does it mean for flexible systems that take into account dynamism in the climate in the future? Well, first and foremost, it increases the, the importance and urgency for having better systems because that, to your point, that historical data is just, you know, no longer compelling or, or applicable. So I think certainly we need people who also can, frankly, work more quickly um, in this space as well because, like, we don't have time to waste. Like, uh, but communities in Michigan should not be on edge every time we get a, a heavy rainstorm. And they are. You know, you don't know if it's this going to be the one that's going to flood the freeways. It's going to be the one that's going to flood people's basements and living spaces. Um, and, and so I think we also need to, as we are making these historic investments, like there's, there's more money than ev has ever and maybe will ever be made available from the federal government for infrastructure investment right now through the Inflation Reduction Act that, the, that President Biden signed, that the Democrats in Congress delivered to him and the Vice President. Um, so that means that right now, as we are making the decisions about how to use those federal dollars, like we need smart people right now to help us direct those investments in the right way. And so that is a data and information opportunity as well, because we need to know what problems we need to solve, what scale these solutions need to be, and therefore how we can design those systems to solve these problems. So to some of those programs, one of the specific questions that came out was about microplastics. So I, I, you've talked about the, uh, positions around invasive species and things. Are there other programs for microplastics or other kinds of pollution types of problems? So the short answer is yes. Um, I think, and, and so those, those programs sort of, sort of 
there's a pretty wide spectrum of them. So I would say, yeah, and it's worth a person kind of digging into that a little further. Um, I, I think we certainly in Michigan, when we, when we are talking about a sort of broad spectrum response to climate change, um, we think a lot about emissions. We think a lot about water quality. We also do think about waste. And we think about sort of, um, you know, what types of, uh, you know, products and materials that we need to reduce. We need to not use in the first place. Yeah. Um, we need to change the incentives around using in Michigan, but from our from private sector uh, perspective, um, so that we can sort of more upstream deal with what ultimately turns into microplastics that exists in our, you know, whether it's in our soil and our water or even in the air that we um, inhale. Yeah. So the, the water theme semester, we're, we have 700 students all working on water this semester. One of their last jobs will be to actually pick the theme for next year's incoming class. What are some other large-scale problems like water that you, from the state perspective, would love us to take on as information professionals? <laughs> I have a lot of answers. Um, but you only gonna maybe pick one. Uh, I think I would say I am really interested in, so uh, maybe, maybe I'm thinking about this because like I have elementary school age children, my baby girl just started pre-K. And I'm actually really interested in understanding how we can better understand the, the quality of like educator interactions. Like I wanna understand how we can know whether curriculums work and how we can evaluate that effectively and how we can train professionals on it. Um, so we can make sure that as we equip, we're, we're equipping education professionals better than we ever have uh, here in the state of Michigan. We are um, paying student teachers in the state of Michigan, something that's never happened in the history. It's one of the, one of the barriers between person becoming a teacher is because you can't afford to not get paid to be a student teacher. And I really want to equip them with the ability to be able to see that what they're doing is having an impact or not. And this certainly is, is urgent for us as we seek to improve our education outcomes, um, which I think is one of our fundamental challenges in the state. And I'm going to cheat and give you a second one. The other piece that I'm really interested in is really understanding from a, from a decision-making standpoint. Like, I want everybody who currently is a student at SI to, like, stay in the state of Michigan. I want you to stay in the state of Michigan. I want you to get your first job in Michigan. I want you to start your first business in Michigan. I want you to marry somebody from Michigan and like build a family. I want all the Michigan stuff, okay? And I want you to feel safe and protected and respected in Michigan, all the things. And, and I want, because I want our state's population to grow at an accelerated rate. Because more people, that's more um, energy, more ingenuity, uh, more amazing things will happen. And I think there is an opportunity for information professionals to help the state design a strategy for that. Yeah. Like, how should we think about that? And because part of it is we need to retain people like y'all. Now, look, like I said, I was, a, I was a double engineering major, and I graduated, and I left for nine years. Like, I don't want that to be true of anybody who graduates like me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I think that there's, there's a role for everyone to play in helping us address that problem as well. Great. Well, I think uh, everybody joins me in thanking you for being here today. You'll always have a home at the School of Information. Uh, we're so proud of everything that you've done since you've left us and so proud to be part of your story. So thank you again for being here today. Thank you, everybody.